was finally able to deal with, with the, the, the killing of my son, all I could do was cry and cry and cry. And to this day, the anger just doesn't stop, especially with them being now harassed by the police because they harassed my kids to get to me. They arrest them, they'll stop them in the street, they can't go to the store and come back without the cops stopping them, searching them. They have, they, they come to my house 12.30 in the night. No sooner than they came inside, the cops broke down my door, talking about everybody on the floor. They threatened to take my grandbabies. They're claiming they found all these drugs in my house. We went to court, they dismissed the case because they know they didn't find no drugs in my house. That was just pure harassment. We had a barbecue in front of my house. They beat my oldest son so bad. All I could see was losing another son. I get out and I speak about, you know, the way they have no respect for human life, the way they just harass and abuse and murder innocent people. This is not nothing that somebody told me. This is what I witnessed and experienced for my own. And especially since I do do this now on a national level, going, speaking to other families and seeing what they're going through, these cops are totally out of control. My one wish would be that I was not in this position that I am in and missing my second oldest son and having to live in such pain every day. I wish I still had my son, Malcolm Ferguson. Today, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in police brutality, Malcolm Ferguson's story. To examine how famed New York lawyer Seth Harris at Burns and Harris successfully got justice for Malcolm Ferguson and his family with a record-breaking verdict of $10.5 million against the NYPD. Police abuse remains one of the most serious and divisive human rights violations in the United States today. The horrific images of Rodney King being beat by the LAPD is one of the most blatant reminders of police brutality against innocent victims. The excessive use of force by police officers, including unjustified shootings, severe beatings, and fatal chokings, persists. Because overwhelming barriers to accountability make it possible for officers who commit human rights violations to escape due punishment and often to repeat their offenses. Police and public officials greet each new report of brutality with denials or explain that the act was just an aberration. While the administrative and criminal systems that should deter these abuses by holding officers accountable instead virtually guarantee them impunity. The special insider exclusive investigation discovered that police brutality is persistent and rampant across America and that systems to deal with abuse have failed and that victims seeking redress face daunting obstacles at every point in the process ranging from overt intimidation to the reluctance of local and federal prosecutors to take on brutality cases of officers who have committed these human rights violations. Despite claims to the contrary, from city officials where abuses have become scandals in the media, efforts to make meaningful reforms have fallen short. The barriers to accountability are remarkably similar from city to city. Shortcomings in recruitment, training, and management are common to all. So is the fact that officers who repeatedly commit human rights violations tend to be a small minority who taint entire police departments but are protected routinely by the silence of their fellow officers and by flawed systems of reporting, oversight, and accountability. You will see how Seth Harris proved this case by exposing the lies and the contradictions of the various NYPD police officers. As Seth has often said, the problem of police brutality is much more widespread than most Americans are willing to admit. Our nation practices a selective blindness. In this great and strong nation, we have all become unwitting accomplices to the continuation of the conflict. Seth has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best civil rights trial lawyers in New York and in the nation. He has seen many innocent and hardworking people become victims of police brutality. He understands that police brutality is one of the most serious, enduring, and divisive human rights violations in the United States. The problem is not just in New York, but nationwide, and its nature is institutionalized. And because of that, he is driven to fight for people who have been harmed 
by the willful or negligent actions of others. He learned a long time ago that if a man hasn't discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. His goal is not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure that all Americans have the right to a fair trial, honest cops, impartial prosecutors, and fair judges with no agendas. Because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and justice and power must be brought together so that whatever is just may be powerful, and whatever is powerful may be just. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from New York City at the law firm of Burns & Harris. It is my great pleasure to introduce Seth Harris to the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Steve. Um, tell our audience a little bit about your firm and what kind of cases you generally handle. Sure. We're a uh, small firm here in Lower Manhattan, 10 attorneys, and all we do is represent victims that suffer personal injuries. That could be from an accident, from a police officer, civil rights litigation, uh, or from a doctor or hospital. We have a case today in which you've helped somebody tremendously, um, and it's an unfortunate case where the police shot and killed Malcolm Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Tell our audience a little bit about who was Malcolm Ferguson. Malcolm Ferguson was a, uh, a young fellow who um, was misguided in some ways. Uh, he was doing some odd jobs, probably hanging out with some of the wrong people, uh, but on this particular day, he was doing absolutely nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. They say that he was in possession of drugs after they killed him. Mm -hmm. And he was unarmed, right? He was unarmed. Uh, by their own admission, by the way. Mm -hmm. Remember, when you have a case in court that involves a wrongful death of somebody, you have to go by the version of the defendants, in this case, the police officers. Right. Because they're the only ones left standing. Yeah. yeah. My guy is in here. Mm -hmm. And I never had the pleasure of meeting him. Mm -hmm. um, so we had an undercover agent, undercover police officer. I think his name was Rivera, right? Rivera, yeah, plain clothes, yeah. And he, uh, Malcolm, took off instead of sticking around, and he didn't have any weapon or anything like that. Your officer admitted that in court, didn't he? He admitted that he, uh, that he had no weapon at all. Yeah. And in fact, when you say took off, Steve, let me just uh, uh, bring the facts to light a little bit there. Mm -hmm. He actually just started walking down a hallway, according right. to Rivera. It's not like he ran out in the street or anything of that nature. Yeah. Um, the defense claimed this was an accidental shooting, right? They did. Uh, that somehow uh, the trigger of the gun went off uh, almost by osmosis. You proved otherwise, didn't you? Well, we did, uh, but we did that through Officer Rivera himself. Right. He admitted it. Uh, in essence, he did. Yeah, because from my understanding, when I looked at this case, it requires triggers cannot go off accidentally. It requires, what, 11 pounds of pressure? That's right. And they tested his gun to make sure it had that mm -hmm. pressure and that it was functioning properly, which it was. Right. The only way that gun went off is if he squeezed the trigger with enough force, 11 pounds of force, yeah. to execute that bullet into his brain. Now, in this particular case, what did you have to prove? Well, we had to prove that uh, Officer Rivera was unjustified in shooting this individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he had been claiming, and he had claimed to the district attorney's office earlier, he was never indicted, by the way, uh, that this gun went off accidentally. But then it came to the civil case. The only time he ever came to court to testify in this case, it was never a criminal proceeding, because mm -hmm. the DA's office chose not to go forward on that, on that end of it. Mm -hmm. And thank God for the, for the civil side, because it was there that a jury first got to hear how during this one-armed struggle, a one-armed struggle according to Rivera, where Malcolm apparently pulled his jacket sleeve, he decided with his free hand, the officer, to pull his gun out of the holster, and he intentionally put it on Malcolm's shoulder. That was no accident. Yeah. When the gun went off, the officer says, an accident. Mm -hmm. The truth is... He executed the, him. He executed him. Yeah. That barrel of the gun was right up against his temple, according to the ME report mm -hmm. and the testimony from the ME that came in during that trial. Mm -hmm. 
What were some of the problems that you had in pursuing this case? Well, some of the problems that we had was the public perception of Malcolm was that he was somehow a drug dealer or that type of thing. And that's how uh, the police department had painted him. Yeah. But in fact, there was no evidence of that at all. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it, now you cleverly used the medical examiner's certificate to demonstrate pain and suffering, correct? We did, uh, uh, and while we were successful... Uh, Explain how you did that. Yeah. There was just a, a time on the certificate itself that showed uh, the time that he was shot as opposed to the time that he died. Yeah. Uh, and there was about a minute differential there. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the appellate division disagreed with that pain and suffering finding. Mm -hmm. So the money that was awarded to his estate for that was set aside. Yeah. They said there's no, there's no reasonable way that somebody could be shot at point blank range and have any suffering at all. And it's, it's, it's a point I can't debate. It seems, yeah. uh, it seems logical what they said. The verdict came in at what? Ten and a half million dollars? Ten and a half million dollars, right. Million. In, in total, yeah. right. Which included punitive damages and uh, which are damages again to punish yeah. an officer uh, or officers for what they did. One of the reasons we liked doing this particular case in this show was as a result of Malcolm Ferguson's unfortunate demise, his mother, Juanita Young, yes. has become a very strong advocate uh, against police brutality, she correct? Has, yes. She's here. We're going to bring her on. Let's do that. Perfect. It is my great privilege to introduce Juanita Young. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming here. Um, take us back to that day when your son was shot by the police. Tell us what happened. It was um, on March 1st, Tuesday evening. I had came back in from shopping. My daughter said to me, Ma, people, pe people keep calling here looking for Malcolm. I'm like, what? So I paid it no mind. Then my niece called me. She says, Aunt Nita, where's Malcolm? I said, I don't know. Then my kids had the, t the television on, and I hear the cops shooting this man running over the roof um, of some building. But I was like, why would they shoot somebody running? Then my children said to me, my daughter said to me, Ma, there's a lot of cop cars outside in front of the building. I said, lock the door, let me go downstairs and find out what's going on. I go downstairs, there's all these people in front of the door. They asked me if I knew I'm Malcolm Ferguson. I said, he's my son. They said, we're sorry to tell you, we found him dead in the hallway. I'm like, you did not find my son dead in the hallway. And I, by then I was angry. And I remember the man trying to talk to me. He had made me so upset. I just totally lost it. And I was so upset, I remember. And my kids were like screaming all over the place. And the cop was steady trying to talk to me and I picked up something and I told him to get away from me to leave me alone and he kept on. And I don't even know what I hit him with. And by then my whole building was like trying to figure out what was going on. And the next thing I re remember was I ended up going to the hospital in respiratory arrest because I have bad asthma. But then I realized I had to get back home because I needed to be with my kids. But the doctors refused to let me go home because I really could not breathe. Mm -hmm. But I was able to get myself back together. I went to get my kids. And they said, Aunt Nita, don't go to that building. Not being in my right mind, I couldn't place where the building was. Because I had heard the address on the news. And when I laid down, I couldn't go to sleep, it hit me where that building was. So I got up 
like 6.30 in the morning, took the train, and I went to the building. And from that day to this, that's been my life. What was the cops' explanation to you regarding how your son was killed? They claimed that it was a struggle and the gun accidentally went off. That my son was trying to go for the cop's gun. Mm -hmm. I said to the DA and the cops, show me the fingerprints on that gun. All of a sudden that story changed. Mm -hmm. There was, he never went for the cop's gun. Mm -hmm. um, and in the court, Seth was able to prove that the cop was lying, that your son was unarmed, and that he wasn't following proper police procedure when he shot and killed him, right? Correct. And executed him. Yes. Basically, right? Yes. Um, as a result of your son's unfortunate passing, uh, you have become a, an advocate against police brutality, correct? Yes. Uh, I understand that you are part of uh, the October 22nd Coalition Against Police Brutality, and you have a march every year? Yes. Where do you, where do, you do this march? Every year we change the venue. Yeah. So it's just that this year we're going to march from 14th Street to the Lower East Side. And these are uh, survivors of, and families of people who have been shot and killed by the police, right? Yes. How many are there? How many in a march that you that you get involved with? How many families? Yeah. How many people are at that march? Usually? It depends. Every year it, it changes. It's never the same. Okay. Um, I also understand that you are very active in in other groups or advocacy against police brutality. In fact, you had your uh, your own case where someone, one of the cops, pushed you or something down the stairs. Correct? Yes. Yeah. What is your opinion of the NYPD? They have no respect for human life. Mm -hmm. Because the way, speaking from experience, yeah. the way they have tortured my body tells me they have no respect for yeah. human life. Well, fortunately, Seth uh, handled your case very well. Uh, got some sort of justice. No one can ever bring back anybody um, but what is your if you were to tell the world about uh, how Seth handled your case what's your opinion of his law firm and how he handles civil rights cases well personally I think Seth and Seth knows that I think he's a fantastic attorney mm -hmm. because um, like I said leading up to the court cases you know dealing with several other, other attorneys mm -hmm. um, when I met Seth and he understood my position. Um, quite a few other attorneys refused to deal with me because their motive was to gain some kind of financial gain. Mm -hmm. And when I told that to Seth, he says to me, you know, Ms. Young, you seem very determined, I'm going to take your case. He did not say, well, if you don't, you know, go along with me, I cannot do this. Yeah. And seeing him work, his work, I think he is a fantastic yeah. attorney. These other lawyers would tell you they wanted to settle the case so they could get money or yes. what? Yes. And but Seth said he's going to take it all the way to trial, right? He Which took he it did. all the way to trial, even when he went to try to get other information from other attorneys. Mm -hmm. Not having that information, yeah. he was still able to prove, you know, that Louis Rivera murdered my son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, I want to thank you very, very much for being on the program. My condolences for the passing of your son. And we really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Police brutality in New York is still a major problem, isn't it? It's a major problem, and it seems to only be getting worse. They have no line of communication between the Corporation Counsel's Office that represents the police in civil cases, and the police department uh, in terms of the payouts that are going on mm -hmm. and the retraining that's not occurring. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But do you see, does the court ever order in cases like this, like, you know, like Malcolm's case, 
there were procedures put in place about when you're supposed to fire your weapon. Correct. Those procedures were not followed. Those procedures are supposed to be taught to the police. Maybe they were taught to this police officer, maybe they weren't. But is there extra supervision now to make sure that police officers are reinforced with this kind of training so this doesn't happen again? I wish that there was. There is retraining possibilities. Yeah. Whether Officer Rivera had it or didn't was never shared with us. Yeah. But uh, there seems to be really a, a lack of care on the police department's part yeah. about these civil cases. Except now in Juanita's case, yeah. in Malcolm's case, because punitive damages were actually paid by the city, somebody now, now may finally be paying attention. Well, let's hope that as a result of this show, that people become more aware of it, and let's hope that things are improved. And I want to thank you very much for being on the program. Thanks for having me, Steve. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.